Hello, it's 8 o'clock. This is The UK Tonight. Coming up, an urgent investigation amid claims hospital staff tried to access the Princess of Wales medical records. The London Clinic, where Kate underwent surgery in January, says there's no place at the hospital for those that deliberately breach patients' trust. All the while, the noise around the princess continues and the pressure builds at a time when she's trying to recuperate from a major operation. Coming up, we'll discuss what the royal family what the royal family's next step should be as they try to finally move on from the questions about Kate's health. Also tonight, a woman arrested at the vigil for Sarah Everard speaks out after winning compensation from the Met Police. In her first broadcast interview, Jenny Edmonds will be here in the studio to tell me if she thinks the police have changed in the three years since her arrest and what she thinks of the new laws on protests. Plus, why can't we have nice things? Vandals target the Banksy artwork, which appeared in North London on Sunday. And one shell of a mistake. I'll speak to the shopkeeper in Orkney, who ended up with 720 Easter eggs for an island of 500 people after an ordering mishap. Well, that's come and much more on The UK Tonight. An urgent inquiry is underway amid reports that staff at the hospital where the Princess of Wales underwent surgery in January tried to access her private medical records. The London Clinic says there is no place for those who breach the trust of any patient and the UK Privacy Watchdog is now investigating. Well, it's the latest turn in the frenzy for information about the princess's health. The wild conspiracy theories being shared online won't go away, and public relations experts say the royal family hasn't done enough to end the speculation. Our royal correspondent, Laura Bundock, has this report. It's a high-end hospital, favoured by high-profile patients seeking privacy and security. But did the London clinic breach both? At least one staff member attempted to access Kate's medical records. The information watchdog now investigating. They would be gathering information, as much information as possible, and pulling together evidence to assess whether there was a case that could be taken further and should be taken further. This was Kate's last official outing. She spent 13 nights in hospital after her abdominal surgery treated at the same time as the king. Weeks later, the focus back on the clinic, whose CEO said, we have systems in place to monitor management of patient information and in the case of any breach, all appropriate investigatory, regulatory and disciplinary steps will be taken. The privacy breach has prompted a political response from Health Minister Maria Caulfield, a trained nurse. There are very strict rules about which patient notes you can access. You're only allowed to access the patient notes you're caring for and with their permission. It's pretty severe uh, and it's pretty serious stuff to be accessing notes that you don't have permission to so access. So the London Clinic could be in a lot of trouble? Well, also any, any individuals as well. The princess isn't the only royal with privacy issues. Harry's battle with Fleet Street back at the High Court, with echoes of his mother's difficult times with tabloids. There is one significant difference. Diana sought publicity. Today's royals want to control publicity. And that is where I think the problem has occurred. The fevered fascination with the princess is unlikely to stop, not helped by Kate Gate and the altered family photo. The princess has been told about the breach and it will be a big blow. She wanted time out to recover, but social media had other ideas. Her absence filled with speculation, conspiracies and now this. The investigation will probably take months and Kate may well have returned to public life before we find out what really happened. Laura Bundock, Sky News, Central London. Well, crisis management expert Kevin Craig is with me in the studio now. Um, and Kevin, this is an interesting one because a lot has been done to try and quell the speculation, the conspiracy theories, but nothing seems to be working. What's your take on what the royal family's 
Well, Kensington Palace's next step should be in yeah. all of this. Well, classic public relations uh, theory suggests mm. at this point you have to consider how do you get back control of the story and mm. anticipate what happens next. Now, often one would say, well, is it time actually for a piece to camera, calm it all down, get rid of these mad conspiracy theories, do something in person? Mm. No, is my very strong recommendation. Let's get a bit of context back here to what's happened. Mm. Uh, the, fo the photos shouldn't have been doctored, OK? However or why it happened, it was a mistake, mm. misstep, we all acknowledge that. And we're, the, there's a frenzy online about health speculation, private life speculation surrounding our royals. They started four weeks ago at 61 and 62% favourability for mm -hmm. Kate and William, respectively. They just now have to wait this out. They said at the outset there's a plan and a strategy, which is I'll see you at Easter. Mm. I'm having some time off. OK, the photo was doctored and shot, but can we please get this in context mm. about this family? Um, and one point I feel very strongly about is mm. the detail of health, which you were talking about before we came on, about yeah. the king gave all his details out. Well, she's a young woman still. She's a mother of kids. Do we, just because we have a constitutional monarchy, mm -hmm. deserve every detail? Mm. Do we? No, and I suppose the difference is as well that he is the king. Head of state. And she is the Princess of Wales. Yeah. How much should we know in that respect then? Because you're right, Kensington Palace, the Prince and Princess of Wales have stuck to their end of the bargain. They said she'll be back after Easter. We haven't even got to Easter yet. So in that sense, how much should we know? Is this all we should know? I think there's... What we've got so far? Well, there's no legal or regulatory requirement, mm. right, about what we, the subjects of this thing called our monarchy, mm. should know about the health of the royals. There's an unwritten sort of understanding. I think, personally, I'd be interested in what mo mostly women think, mm. we know enough. OK? Mm. I don't think we have a, a right to know mm. what the details are. Um, and you won't calm down the internet and you won't calm down international press. That's the press. thing, isn't it? We're, we're operating in very different times when it comes to royal health stories. You know, we have broadcasters like Sky News, but we also have social media, which is unregulated, yeah. not subject to the same controls, checks and balances in terms of verifying information. Yeah. And that is where the problem is at the moment, isn't it? And as she said, you cannot control that. So is the best strategy to just ignore it, even though it's spiralling? It is spiralling, but I, I've noticed in the last 48 hours, there's an... In, in our own country, I'm going to forget about the mm. foreign press, that's a whole different discussion. Yeah. In our own country, there's an industry, the commentariat, who say, it's time to do more, you know, the, raw, the press teams at Kensington Palace have got this wrong, etc. Just go back to the facts. A photo shouldn't have been doctored. Most institutions, the royal family, by the way, has been photoshopping and touching up pictures for years, OK? Mm. It's just happened that this one got picked up on. And broadly, the British public um, are favourable of the institution. And I think now the only sensible thing is go back to what they said, do not make this worse, and certainly, as some would suggesting, do not intervene further. What about the fact that there was footage cap captured by a fellow shopper at a farm shop of the Princess of, Princess of Wales leaving? It was then published by a tabloid. I've not had any complaint from Kensington Palace about that. Perhaps because it's in their favour, it actually works well for them. But that seems like a bit of a dangerous game to play, some might say, if you complain about yeah. one thing and not about another. If it's total privacy, yes. everyone stand back. Yeah. Now, that's a really good question, because I have to say, in my industry, we're running PLMR, a comms PR agency, mm. we all saw that and we thought, hang on a minute, mm. has this been set up at arm's length to try and dampen this down without, our, you know, officially doing anything? I hope not. Mm -hmm. I hope not. I hope it was just, you know, chance, mm. because if you start to play that game, as you say, that's very risky mm. and you are asking for more of this... I think, unwarranted uh, intrusion and critique. OK, well, in summation, Kevin, you think they should hold the line? Like you said, we haven't got to their deadline of sort of we Easter haven't. and beyond yet, so we, we'll just wait for that. Last thing I want to say is, if it wasn't for this stupid picture mistake, everyone yeah. had their timetable, and that will yeah. never happen again, I'm sure. And potentially, that was the Princess of Wales just trying to do something nice for Mother's Day, right. and it's backfired. OK, Kevin Craig, a crisis management expert, good to get your point of view on the show tonight. Thank you. Uh, well, the latest royal story uh, is sure to feature in tomorrow's papers, of course, our extended press preview and news review coming up from 10.30 tonight. Joining us, uh, the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Mail's Whitehall editor, Claire Ellicott.
A woman who was arrested during the vigil for Sarah Everard on Clapham Common has been paid £10,000 by the Metropolitan Police. Now, a number of women, you'll remember, were detained at this event. It was in March 2021 during COVID restrictions. It followed Sarah's murder by serving police officer Wayne Cousins. One of them that night was Jenny Edmonds. She was held overnight in a police station and then she refused to pay a fine for breaching those COVID restrictions. The Crown Prosecution Service threw out the charges against her and Jenny then sued the Met. The force agreed to pay her compensation last month. Uh, well, I'm pleased to say that Jenny is here with us in the studio for her first TV interview. Jenny, hello. Um, welcome to you. Took a long time to get to this point. Um, remind everyone why you sued the Metropolitan Police. This was for bre breaching your human rights. Talk to me about what you went through on that night. So, I mean, the night was obviously incredibly moving. We were all in just distraught to hear of the way that Sarah had lost her life in such a brutal fashion at the hands of police. Um, it was a very overwhelming experience, to be honest. It was, it was quite frightening. It had been, um, you know, a very moving moment for all of us, but as soon as the police were there, the, these huge numbers of the police totally... Um, totally frightening for them to be there. They were really closing in on everyone there. And because of the, you know, the emotions around this and just the way that they, they um, were imposing on everyone, it made things get a lot more scary. Um, and uh, as I've seen this happen before at protests. I think quite often people talk around, talk about the mishandling or the way that police have mishandled things. But I think sometimes we need to ask why the police even need to be there. They don't seem to make protests safer, in, in my mm. experience. It often leads to confrontation when, and especially in that instance, it really did. Um, and there's something very poignant about, again, those images and that footage captured of women coming together to protest a peaceful protest about mm. the treatment of a young woman at the hands of a police officer and then to see women being arrested and put on the floor by police officers. Um, when you talk about the treatment of women at protests, you're an activist, you go to protests. To you, this wasn't, as you said, an isolated incident. Can you give us an insight as to what it's like to be a female activist attending protests? That, that's such a good question. I mean, it's funny, I, I would, I, I suppose the label activist is given, but I haven't really thought about it like that when you go to a protest. You did what a lot of people there. did that night. Exactly. They were outraged and they wanted to go somewhere to show solidarity and support. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I think all too often we see um, people getting criminalised for really just expressing that, you know, it's your human right to be able to freely assemble mm -hmm. and to demand change mm -hmm. and stand up to injustice, really. Like, you know, people... Protest has always been about trying to make the world a better place. Um, and when you see the police, when you see the state passing laws that clamp down on this sort of thing, you know it's because it's a way to demand change. And unfortunately, all too often you do see that the police can replicate the same sort of harms that we see in society, whether that's racism, whether that's misogyny, whether that's uh, any sort of gender-based um, oppression. Um, and that happens in the sorts of protesters that are cr criminalised as well. And we've seen that a lot with the Palestine protests, for example, yeah. although it really can affect anyone. Yeah, the, the compensation you received, you split with pro-Palestinian protesters and, and a sign of solidarity. Um, in the three years since this happened to you, the Metropolitan Police have been under a lot of scrutiny, mm -hmm. have been subject to the report about how Wayne Cousins was ever a police officer in the first place, and, and that was damning. Mm. But police forces up and down the country have faced the same scrutiny. Mm. And we've heard apologies, um, and we've heard that the police forces have changed. In your opinion, in those three years, do you think anything has changed? Oh, I mean, the last three years, the last 20 years, the last 40 years, I mean, you can't really reform an institution like that. You know, it's... it's founded in a very violent way and, um, and you know, apologies are one thing, but we should be looking at why that harm You didn't even get an apology, did you? I they didn't said get an apology, The no. Metropolitan Police said that the police on that night acted within the law and took yeah. appropriate action because of COVID restrictions, but they said that they gave you this money to draw a line under it. What yeah. did you think when you heard that? 
Exactly. I mean, I wasn't really ever that hopeful for an apology and I also don't necessarily, um, although it's really important for people to feel mm. vindicated and to feel that they've got justice, I don't know what that does mm. really for the larger thing. I think we should be looking at mm. the root causes of harm that lead to them needing to be policed. Uh, in those three years, we have seen larger scale protests on the rise, whether mm. it be about climate change, Black Lives Matter, and now regarding the conflict in the Middle East. What do you think of the portrayal of the protests by the government versus your own experience of them? I mean, it's quite cynical and it's quite transparent, really, to see um, why they want to define left-wing groups as extremists, why they want to increase this sort of sense of fear around protests, because, you know, it's, it's as I said previously, it's trying to, you know, change the world to fight back against injustices, whether that's from the government, or whether mm -hmm. that's violence in our wider society. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, um, I just I just think it's a, a distraction, essentially, from the larger issues. I mean, quite obviously, with the government, you know, our economy is in a really dire state. You know, mm. we have funding, uh, services have been cut. We have poor wages. You know, these are things that the government wants to stop us. Trying. Well, the new policing bill came in last year and it changed things legally somewhat. Mm -hmm. But it, do you think it changed the optics on protests in the UK? The government said that this will not undermine freedom of expression or the right to protest, which is a fundamental right of people here in the UK. But when that new policing bill came in, what did you think of the changes that were made and the message that it sent to those that want to protest in the UK? I mean, it was certainly trying to discourage people from protests, but I think we do have to remember that there were already quite wide-ranging laws to mm -hmm. prevent protest and previous this bill, although it has made it a lot harder. And it, the bill wasn't also just about protest, it also, you know, increased criminalisation in, in loads of different ways. It had a huge impact on the GRT community, had a huge impact to people that are at risk of street violence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... Yeah, we, we have to remember that, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a cynical tactic, but, you know, as there's been some sort of weirdly... You say cynical, but I will just yeah. put this point that the government made. They were yeah. saying it was going to protect the public from highly disruptive protests. Mm -hmm. We saw the protests by climate change activists. They, the government said it had a disproportionate impact on the public, public funds, pu police resources, often dangerous with people scaling bridges. Do you support that kind of protest? The, the nature of that protest is maximum disruption and it does split public opinion and that's why they say this new policing bill had to come in. That was one of their main reasons for it. I do understand that. I do understand that it really splits public opinion. I, I, I myself do think that that sort of protest, you know, it's about, it's about the reasons that people are out there, the reasons that people are having to take mm. such measures is because, you know, of the severity of the things that they're, they're protesting mm. get. The climate, claim, chi climate crisis yeah. is, is the defining, you know, fear that we ought to be having and... And really, we should be looking at what could be done more than talking about the individual protests, I think. And just finally, quickly, there was that new government definition of extremism. Mm -hmm. What's your interpretation of it? Because critics say it's going to shut down vital debate and there's also concerns it will actually create more division, do more harm than good. I, I really do think it will create more divi division and it's also um, about sort of... Um, letting the government dictate what is good dissent, what is bad dissent, when really we should be, you know, dissent, but um, when really we should be looking at being able to freely express um, our opinions. Uh, what I will say is that even as we have these countdowns, even mm. we, if, if there is more division, we also have people coming together. We have mm -hmm. people standing in solidarity with each other. We had all these police monitoring groups, these cop watch groups that sprung up in the in the wake, in the tradition of um, police monitoring groups like Tottenham Rights, mm -hmm. and where people looking out for each other and improving community safety through um, non-police ways, um, you know, community interventions and that sort of thing. So it's easy to focus just on the negative, and we should obviously be doing that, but we need to look at how we can work together as well. Very in nicely. Solidarity. Uh, very nicely put. Jenny, really good to talk to you. Thank you for coming in to speak to us Thank in the you. UK tonight. Jenny Edmonds there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now, an IT worker has been found guilty of murdering a couple before changing their will to try to inherit their company. 61-year-old Stephen Buxton and his wife Carol, who was 64, were found dead in their home in West Mercy in Essex on Easter Sunday last year. Luke DeWitt, who had befriended and worked for the couple, created a series of fake online personas, which he then used to manipulate them before he killed them. Well, it's a horrifying uh, tale. Our correspondent, <laughs> Ashna Hurnag, has been following this story. Um, Ashna, it's so disturbing, the manipulation that went in 
to the murder of this couple. Um, tell us more. You're right, uh, Sarah Jane. I think um, today the court heard a very similar tale how this was a man who had cultivated a, a very manipulative uh, friendship with this couple over a number of years built upon manipulation and deceit. And he ultimately it worked um, and befriended these millionaires, Stephen and Carol Baxter, who are both in their 60s, and in April last year, uh, deliberately drugged and killed the pair of them using the opioid painkiller fentanyl. The 34-year-old double murderer initially met the couple back in 2012. He was hired by them, actually, to build uh, their website for their company, but he became very heavily involved in their family life. Um, and he ended up turning up every day and eventually ended up helping Mrs Baxter with an autoimmune disease that she had, going as far as to giving her health advice, creating fake social media profiles to back up the advice that he was giving to her. And after their death, went as far as to rewrite the couple's will so that their business would be left to him. To uh, And the couple, their son and their daughter, the couple had described uh, DeWitt to them as being a nerd, he, as being weird, but he was the last person to see the couple on the 7th of April, where he was seen leaving the couple's home uh, via their uh, doorbell camera. And the court was told that he watched them die on his mobile phone device because he had rigged their home with cameras and had linked them to his uh, phone. So after giving them this uh, lethal painkiller, then went on to take images of their bodies as they were... Um, found in their conservatory, and, and this is the footage of, of him leaving their home that night. They were found two days later by their daughter, uh, unresponsive, and it was DeWitt that made the 999 call that day. In it, he sounds incredibly calm, but you can hear some distressing voices in the background. Just to confirm, how many people are hurt? <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. Well, how many people require help, just to confirm? Two. Two, two right. Right. So, so, just tell me exactly what happened from what you know, please, just so we can all go to the back of the house. Um, well, we've just turned up to the house and they hadn't, we hadn't really heard from anyone for about a day and a half. So we came round and they sort of got here first and I think they got round to the back, saw through their conservatory that they were sitting in their armchairs, not moving. And um, we smashed the window to get in. But, but yeah, they're, they're both stiff, cold and on Easter Sunday, so that's two days after uh, DeWitt had mm. murdered them. Um, he was also seen talking to police via their uh, body-worn camera footage. In the background, once again, you can hear family members sounding quite distressed and crying, uh, but DeWitt, meanwhile, uh, terribly calm, as you can see. Um, and you say you last saw them on Friday? Friday. I, think I'm a, I got home just before eight, so that's when I left. <laughs> and me and Steve were just talking about work and... <laughs> Well, today, DeWitt has been found guilty of murdering um, Mr and Mrs Baxter, both, as I say, in their 60s. He will be sentenced later in the week, but one thing that struck me yesterday about uh, some of the comments from police that were coming out today, the head of the major crime unit at Essex Police described him as, without a doubt, one of the most dangerous men that he'd ever come across. Horrible. Um, Ashna, thank you so much. Ashna Hurignag there with the details of that story. Thank you. Well, still to come here on the UK tonight, uh, we'll take a look at why Greg stores all across the country were forced to close today because of an IT failure. Also ahead, that new Banksy mural in North London defaced. It only appeared a couple of days ago. And we'll speak to the Orkney shop owner who was forced to hatch a plan after accidentally ordering more Easter eggs than the entire island's population. When I was 21 weeks pregnant, I found out that um, I was going into preterm labour. Um, they did everything they could to try and stop that, but I still ended up <laughs> having the twins at um, 25 weeks. Obviously, it's a very, very scary time when you, when you have babies that are um, premature. So I had Luna and Luca on the 31st of Jan in 2022, and um, obviously we're rushed to neonatal, um, and you just kind of prepare, um, try and prepare yourself for a very long stay in hospital. You were in hospital a long time, weren't you? Yes, um, 89 days in total, Luna was in hospital for. And at the beginning, it was Luna that was um, very sick. She was the um, very sick baby. And we, were, we weren't really concerned about Luca because he was doing really well. Um, but then very suddenly, when he was just three days old, he died of a condition called neck. 
Um, so then we had to kind of deal with the grief and the loss of losing a baby, which obviously is, you know, you can't really put can't into words. To no, can't and to um, then still have to deal with another baby who's very sick and poorly in the neonatal. She moved to special care when she was about seven weeks old, and that's when we kind of knew that she was kind of on the, the straight and narrow. The Tommy's New Research Centre, um, basically set up because at the moment, um, 53,000 babies are estimated to be born preterm <laughs> in the UK, um, which is just, you know, such, such a high number. And those children, you know, lots of them can die or they can have lots of complications. And the research centre aims to really cut that number and have lots of researchers kind of working together to try and come up with ways to kind of stop preterm labour and awfully, and also offer care, which um, for everybody is consistent across um, all different hospitals. <laughs> Hello, welcome back. Now, Greggs became the latest major retailer to suffer IT problems today. A technical issue meant the stores across the country had to close. The baker says the problem is now resolved. But it follows the likes of McDonald's, Sainsbury's and Tesco, who all had IT issues over the past week. So what on earth is going on? Uh, let's bring in retail expert Diane Whirl, uh, who joins us now. Um, Diane, as one social media user put it, my heart goes out to all those with hangovers this morning who are unable to buy anything at Greg's. But there's a serious point to all of this, isn't it? Cyber security and the problems that can arise from a business's reliance on tech. Absolutely. And I think we forget this in large part when things are running normally and running smoothly. We forget how much we rely on tech and how much security is absolutely needed to keep our transactions and our whole economy safe, really. And you know, this is the fourth retailer in a week that's experienced issues around their payment. And I'm sure there are a lot of retailers out there tonight looking at their own systems and really trying to bolster the security of those two. Yeah, none of these companies said that they suffered a cyber attack that led to these tech failures. McDonald's, however, that suffered one was quick to stress that malicious actors had nothing to do with it. And the haste with which they put out that statement sort of reflects the fact that a cyber attack is a real worry for companies now. Oh, it's a huge worry. I mean, millions and millions of pounds are pumped into um, cyber security in every business ar around the globe because they know it's so sophisticated. And you're right, there has been no evidence or we haven't been told that there's been any cyber attack. But personally, I'm not a great believer in coincidence. And it seems too coincidental that four retailers mm. in a week have had issues with their payments. Um, so we just don't know. But um, whatever the cause, you know, it led to operational difficulties and possibly each of those retailers are sharing some element of the software platform behind the scenes that has had a bug um, and has led to these issues that they're all facing. At this stage, we don't know, but I'm sure a lot of retailers are sitting there in deep discussions with their IT teams looking at this really seriously. Yeah, you know, some of those affected have come out and said it was about a software update. Others have said it's crossing over to a new bit of technology. It's a concern for the retailer, of course, for that to happen because it's a loss of money. But it's also a concern for the consumer, isn't it? Because of data security, which people are so much more aware now as to how much information you're handing over to a company, even when you're just using your car to pay. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's lots of... Um, programs and topical pieces of news around the risk to our own personal security. So, of course, people are undoubtedly going to feel a little bit more nervous around making electronic payments. So I wouldn't be surprised if more people start to carry a little bit more cash um, and start to pay, make few more payments in cash. Um, but we are so bound up with tech around payment processes now that it's very hard for any of us to pull back on that. Um, so we, we, but I think you're right, we will be, as consumers, we will be a little bit more cautious as a result of this. 
Yeah, well, those who went into Greg's with a bit of cash this afternoon probably feeling very smug as they sat there with their sausage rollers. Lots of people had to leave. Uh, Diane Well, thank you so much for speaking to us, Diane Well, their retail expert on the UK tonight. Thank you. Now, that new Banksy mural in North London has been defaced after appearing just a few days ago. The green painting on the side of a block of flats in Finsbury Park was first spotted on Sunday morning. A day later, the elusive artist confirmed that he was behind that project and crowds flocked to see the new artwork. But now, just three days after it popped up, the Banksy piece has been defaced. White paint thrown all over it. A fence has now been put around the artwork to try and stop more vandalism. Well, we have a statement from Indislington Council that said it's sad to see the piece has been defaced. When the mural first arrived in Islington, we moved quickly to put in place temporary measures to protect it and manage the crowds, such as installing fencing and having visits from park patrol officers. We are discussing future solutions with the homeowner to enable everyone to enjoy this artwork while protecting it, the tree and the surrounding area. A new report into vaping has found it could be linked to cancer in a similar way to smoking. Researchers at University College London analysed cheek cells in vapours and in smokers, and they found similar changes to the DNA in both. Well, it's the first major study to link vapes to an increase in the risk of cancer. Our health correspondent, Ashish Joshi, has more. Dove started vaping six years ago as a smoker. He was looking for a healthier and cheaper option. My friends were starting it up as well. I tried theirs. It was a nice experience. You don't have to deal with carrying tobacco, everything else. The cost of cigarettes were going up. It seemed like a more cost-affordable option. And it tasted nice, so why not? Dove says other people who swap do it for the same reasons. So are most of your customers ex-smokers or people who are looking to give up smoking? For the most part, yes, I would say so. But now scientists have, for the first time, made a link between e-cigarettes and an increased risk of cancer. What we have found is that basically changes to the DNA of cells, for instance, in the mouth, um, but they are also reflective of lung tissue um, that are found in smokers, where we know that there is a link to cancer, um, are also observed in e-cigarette users. Tobacco and vapes, Bill. The research comes on the same day the country moved towards stopping the next generation taking up smoking. The tobacco and vapes bill means anyone turning 15 this year will never legally be sold cigarettes as the age limit will rise by one every year. The bill will also tackle vaping by introducing new powers to regulate new flavours and packaging that targets children. But that's it. But now we know about this link to cancer, is there a danger that the new law is already falling behind the science? The country's chief medical officer thinks more research is needed. I think it's a useful bit of initial science, but it's not the same as a large study proving a, a link. That'll take a lot longer. But I think what it reinforces is our central message, which is whilst we encourage people who currently smoke if they find vapes helpful to swap to vaping, we absolutely do not recommend that people uh, who currently do not smoke take up vaping, uh, and it is utterly unacceptable to market to children. The Prime Minister has made banning vapes his personal crusade, urging children to stay away from them. And that message will be easier to deliver if the science proving e-cigarette harms continues to build. Ashish Joshi, Sky News. Still to come here on the UK tonight. More royal drama, the crown leading the way as the BAFTA TV nominations are announced. And we'll find out why imposter syndrome is such a big problem for women in science and tech.
welcome back to the UK tonight. Now, if you've never heard of imposter syndrome, where have you been? Uh, you're very fortunate because that probably means you haven't suffered from it. It's the feeling that you don't deserve your job or role. And new research suggests that it's especially prevalent amongst women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, or STEM, as they're collectively known. It's a sector dominated by men, and some 65% of women have admitted doubting their place in the field. Uh, we're joining me now, uh, physicist Dr Jess Wade and Dr Julia Laura Salora, winner of the UNESCO Women in Science Award. Ladies, welcome. And Julia, first of all, uh, congratulations. Thank you so uh, much. You picked up your award on Monday night, so you're still buzzing from <laughs> yeah, your very win. very fresh of you. Um, first of all, um, talk to us about what you do in your field and how you got into it. We'll get on to imposter syndrome in a minute, but I'm so fascinated if, you know, we're talking about women looking for role models and mentors and feeling like they belong in the world of STEM, what your path was like. So I'll start by saying what I do currently. Mm -hmm. So on my daily basis, I'm actually an applied mathematician. Mm -hmm. So I specifically work on developing mathematical models for studying biological systems. So mm -hmm. it's a very interdisciplinary and new area of research. Very exciting uh, to be in. Um, regarding my path, I think it was odd compared to what people might think. I got to decide what I wanted to do quite late on. Mm -hmm. So when I was already studying, um, so towards university, actually, uh, I just fell in love with maths at that point. And then I, I was very lucky to have a great um, range of people supporting me and, uh, you know, my supervisor and everyone just getting me through the path. So it was great to have also some incredible role models, both women as well as men supporting me around and believing in me. And once you became established and an award winner, how comfortable were you in the field? Because we talk about imposter syndrome and we talk about trying to get more women into STEM. We've been talking about that for years, haven't we, ladies? And the figures are not going up. So, so what's, it, what's your experience been like in the field? Well, the word is very fresh, so <laughs> <laughs> I guess it, it's, uh, it's helping, but of course it's been sometimes tough. Um, I did myself suffer from imposter syndrome, most mm. of all when I was studying. Um, the feeling of not belonging and not being enough because sometimes you don't fit with the stereotypes of what you think it should mm. be. Um, and this is really why um, programs like the Laura UNESCO for Women in Science are so important, because they showcase role models, but they mm. also help us changing the narrative about, you know, how a scientist should look. There is no one unique way. There are mm. so many stories, and we need to showcase the great work that women are doing, mm. because there are amazing women already out there. Yeah. It's just a matter of giving them the platform and giving them the visibility. Uh, well, Jess, I know that that's something you believe in, a mathematician and, and sitting alongside a physicist here. And Jess, you spotted this. And what I love about your story is that you're giving back in terms of there are those role models and amazing women in STEM now and in the past, and you noticed that they weren't quite being shouted about enough. So, so talk to me about what you did. Yeah, I mean, I, I also was lucky enough to receive the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Prize in 2021, and that's really kind of pushed forward my whole scientific career. Mm -hmm. And actually hugely, like Julia, very grateful for this flexible support for your research. Mm. And also that focus on saying, these are some of the scientific leaders of tomorrow, mm. so let's celebrate them today. And I guess, you know, I went into a physics department. I did arts and sciences and maths at school, got into a physics department and um, looked around and realised there were very few women there. Mm -hmm. There were very few non-white people there. And actually, it's a subject that requires you to be quite privileged to think about going into it. Mm -hmm. You come from quite a high socioeconomic background. Um, so I started thinking a lot about ways we could encourage more people to come into science and actually then realised that what we really need to do alongside that inspiration part is celebrating and championing the phenomenal women scientists we have. Mm -hmm. um, so in about 2018, I started a project. Well, I've done a whole bunch of things, but in 2018, I started a project to tell their stories better on Wikipedia. Um, this hugely important democratised platform for knowledge sharing, which probably you've used today. Mm -hmm. Certainly everyone watching has probably used in the last week. Um, but does a really bad job of telling women's stories and a particularly bad job of telling women scientists' stories. And um, so at the beginning of 2018, I started writing these Wikipedia biographies of women scientists and I just never stopped because, <laughs> because they are so <laughs> remarkable. Yeah. They are so inspiring. They are doing such wonderful things and um, helping us build a better planet mm. for tomorrow and protecting all humans on it for today. Yeah, literally hidden figures. In fact, I think there's, there was a film about that. Um, but you've got up to 2,000 entries today. And talk to me about... 
aside from celebrating the women that are already there, how can we make STEM more accessible for women? Because, you know, despite the push and talking about it, we've spoken about it, I've spoken about it here on Sky News many, many times, the numbers of women going into the field, girls and women, don't seem to be going up. Yeah, I think it's two parts. I think you're right. We need to do something on those numbers going in. And I think that's a big focus on how we support our science educators, mm. you know, our teachers, yeah. especially in subjects like physics and maths. We need to make sure that we're recognising how brilliant teachers are and paying them properly mm. so they stay in it and letting them teach, not making them overburdened mm. by other things. So improve our teaching quality and get more specialist teachers, mm -hmm. and, but also support people throughout their early career. It's, it's, it's one thing bringing them in, but actually keeping them saying, we recognise at this particularly vulnerable point of your career, you're so employable in all of these mm -hmm. different professions. What can science do to keep you? Mm -hmm. Well, we can give you flexible funding. We can make your job more secure. We can make sure you have access to caring grants if you might mm -hmm. have to look after elderly parents or have children. Mm -hmm. So we need to rethink the way that academic culture is set up so that we better support women when they're making those decisions mm. about what to do next. So it's that early inspiration part, it's that middle career development part, and then when people are shining, we need mm. to write about them in history books. Yeah, help them in and help them stay. Um, well, Dr Jess Wade, thank you, and Dr Juliet Laura Salora, who played down your work because your long-term goal with what you're doing is to help find a cure for cancer. Well, yeah, I'm a very applied mathematician, so yeah. the idea is that I try to do my part in trying to help, like also other amazing scientists to find amazing how we can better scientists. tackle. Brilliant, <laughs> girls! Thank you so much. Really great so much to have you in the studio. Us. Thank you so much. Uh, now, the final series of The Crown leads the nominations for this year's BAFTA TV Awards. Eight nods, including leading actor for Dominic West, who portrays uh, Charles, the then Prince of Wales. But it will not win the biggest prize, Best Drama, which is going to be a fight between Happy Valley, The Gold, Slow Horses and Top Boy. Sky News has also been nominated for coverage on Myanmar and the Israel-Hamas war, as our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer reports. It is a very British battle of the social classes at this year's TV BAFTAs. Happy Valley's return after a seven-year break, beloved by critics, arguably the one to beat. Up for five for Sarah Lancashire's impeccable acting and Sally Wainwright's brilliant script, the story of cops, killers and a working-class community. The Crown doesn't ask existential questions of itself. Perhaps it should. Fighting it out against a drama that imagines how the other half live. While the final series of The Crown didn't exactly win rave reviews with its somewhat soapy take on recent royal history, tellingly it's not up for best drama, but it has picked up the most BAFTA nominations this year with eight. Elizabeth Debicki's Diana and Dominic West's Charles, both in contention for their acting. I tried to do right by him and, and, uh, um, and as a parent I, I you know, feel a certain uh, sympathy for him in what he was going through at the time that we're talking about. Why bother going on? An outstanding year for prestige TV drama, which sees Bella Ramsey recognised for The Last of Us, going head-to-head -head with Helena Bonham Carter for her role in Nolly as a crossroads legend. <sighs> Perhaps a surprise, the seven nominations for this one-off story of a sales assistant and the demon who tells her she has to murder three people to prevent the end of the world. An idea which could only come from the brain of Black Mirror writer Charlie Brooker. As the world gets more and more absurd, it just, it just means that you have to sort of approach things slightly differently. You just have to keep turning the dial up, I suppose. We are in the middle of a forest, in a jungle really, and they're attempting to keep these men alive. And Sky News leads the way when it comes to the news category. Up for two out of a possible three nominations, one for Chief Correspondent Stuart Ramsey's extraordinary eyewitness reporting from Myanmar, his team having spent a month undercover living in the jungle. Where there were homes, there is now destruction. And our special programme on the Israel and Hamas conflict, which aired two weeks after the October 7th attacks. A huge team effort, also in contention. Succession's grand goodbye sees it up for five, with Brian Cox and Matthew McFadden's performances singled out. It's one of the few nominated shows which has bowed out over the last year. And while some of the characters might have hoped for better, the ceremony in May, a final chance for a happy ending. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Coming up on the UK tonight, we'll have all the sport for you, including the very latest coming out of the Miami Open, where Andy Murray is on court. And we'll speak to the shop owner 
in Orkney after an excessive delivery left his island with more Easter eggs than people. We've got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News. Welcome back to the UK tonight. Coming up, uh, why one Orkney island now has more Easter eggs than people. Uh, but first, Teddy is here with the sport. Hello. Good evening. Um, interesting press conference today in the world of rugby. Owen Farrell, not your usual press conference. This is a man who pretty much came with his heart on his sleeve today. He absolutely did. It was ahead of Saracen's game this weekend against Harlequins at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Big London doubleheader, but very candid from the former England captain, who basically confirmed that he stepped away from England duty this Six Nations spring. And bearing in mind, he's the second in the all-time list of point scorers in international rugby history, so it's a big move to do. Could have potentially tried to chase down Dan Carter, but stepped away in order to prioritise his and his family's mental well-being. Now, his coach, Mark McCall, has spoken to, about people in the media needing to look at themselves for their criticism of him in the Autumn World Cup, where he uh, got booed by the fans, but also media people were critical. But he's actually alluded to the fact he deleted his social media accounts in France and spoke quite openly about how some of that stuff filters through to you. And interesting in terms of what you... I know you had Gwyneth Paltrow on last week, didn't you, talking about how you deal with that in the social media age for your kids and things. But you think for a 32-year-old man who probably grew up really before social media was in, it, in its prime, made his debut as a professional at 17, had to deal with the fact his dad was a legend of rugby league and rugby union, Andy Farrell, yet has made this phenomenal career. He's won Six Nations, he's won European titles with Saracens as well. But for him to say that it, it was mental well-being and also to allude to social media, deleting his accounts, but saying ultimately, he says... It's not anyone's opinion you respect or not, and people he respects wouldn't write in the comments on social media. So perhaps his message is in there and saying that he's trying to get back to enjoying his, his rugby once again. It's interesting, isn't it? There's a big debate going on about comment sections mm. on anything online now because it's not filled with very nice stuff. People tend to comment awful things on social media rather than nice things Absolutely. the majority of the time. Um, but let's talk about his future, particularly for the British and Irish Lions, because there are question marks around that because of the moves that he's made. You know, did he, did he reveal anything well, about that? What it, do we think? Well, the brilliant subplot I mentioned his dad is that you can play for British and Irish Lions even if you are playing in France. You can't yeah. currently for England, but you have to be selected by his dad. And here's what he had to say <laughs> about that, whether he's spoken to his old man. Oh, dear. 
I've asked, spoken to my dad about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've told him. I've told him. Well done. If that, if that counts, if that counts. No, it's like it's it's not it's it's not. There's nothing to talk about. Whatever whatever happens, happens. There's always lunch on Easter Sunday, <laughs> good family chat. It's, it's going to be plenty of time. It's June in Australia next uh, next year, so even if he is going to France, surely he can have a conversation with his dad before that. <laughs> yeah, so plenty can play of for the Sunday line. dinners to talk about that. Yeah. Good, to, <laughs> good, good to have a, a good note that after a serious press conference. Uh, news of Andy Murray coming up. The Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. One in five people are neurodivergent, meaning they have a difference in brain function. This one in five may be autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, or have ADHD, or another form of neurodiversity. I think being in sport as someone who's dyslexic and is calculic um, can be really challenging day to day, particularly with the numbers and distances and times and things. I think it's something that I've come to realise that the reasons why I do sport have very much to do with the fact that I am neurodiverse as well. Obviously, people will have heard probably of, of dyslexia. I mean, give me a sense of um, what it's like to, to, be, to be both dyslexic and dyscalculic. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Uh, now, we always like to leave you with something weird or wonderful here on the UK tonight, and this next story certainly falls into both of those categories. One shop owner in Orkney had to scramble to hatch a plan after an excessive order for Easter. Dan Duffy, the owner of Sinclair General Stores on the Orkney island of Sunday, meant to order 80 chocolate eggs, but accidentally ordered 80 cases, which means he's been left with 720 eggs, way more than is needed for the population of 500 people. Well, I'm pleased to say uh, that he's now raffling off 100 of the eggs to a lucky winner in aid of the RNLI. And Dan joins us now to tell us all about this extraordinary story. I'm sorry, Dan, I had to put you through that. So talk to me about what happened when all these eggs arrived. Yeah, um, firstly, I can't believe how much this story's blown up. But, um, yeah, when the eggs arrived, it was, uh, yeah, slightly embarrassing for me. Um, couldn't really pass on the blame, so just kind of had to uh, <laughs> to laugh a little bit and uh, and get on with it. Well, I can see them all behind you. You can't move for Easter eggs. So talk to me about the population of the island you're on and what, you know, how many Easter eggs you sell on average over that period. Yeah, so we're on the, the beautiful Isle of Sandy here in Orkney, and uh, I believe the population is somewhere around 500 people. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have roughly thought we'd probably sell around 80 Easter eggs. So uh, the idea was to get 80, 80 Easter eggs in. Um, little did I know I was ordering 80 cases of Easter eggs. So, uh, yeah, we've been left with one or two extra. Oh, well, Dan, look, the challenge is on. I'm somebody that eats more than one Easter egg over Easter maybe more than two. So the challenge is on for the people of the island to help you out here, because obviously you've paid for them all, but you're also going to raffle off to um, raise some money for the RNLI. What are your other plans? How many Easter eggs can you eat? Yeah, to be honest, look, I, I never for a minute imagined that um, the people would enjoy this story so much, but this kind of story has been floating around now for maybe two days and uh, we've, uh, we've gone crazy with sales. So I think we're down to about our last 100 now, uh, bar the 100 we're giving away. Uh, so, yeah, the people of the island and the people of Orkney and people as far afield as Swindon, which sounds crazy, <laughs> have, uh, have got right behind us and have, uh, have bought all the eggs. <laughs> I love this. So, come Easter weekend, you might not actually have any left. Is there time to order some more correctly, yeah, Dan? It's cra as crazy as it sounds, I think we might need to get some more in just for the, <laughs> for the residents here. Oh, well, Dan, I'm just looking at the um, wonderful structures. You Is that the Empire State <laughs> Building you've just made there? out of those Easter eggs. <laughs> uh, it's brilliant. Well, look, good luck with it. Like you said, come... I mean, we're a couple of weeks, weeks away from Easter now. You'll have run out, so you might have some disappointed customers. So I'd, I'd get back on the computer and, and put the right numbers in. Good luck. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right, thanks, Dan. I was going to put in an order, but it looks like I'll just have to go to my local shop. Uh, that's Dan there on the island of Sandy in Orkney. Uh, right, let's take a quick look at the weather before we go. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly.
the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The weather today, it is pretty changeable at the moment. Um, there is a lot of mild weather around, unsettled into the week. There's going to be a change in wind direction, making it colder, actually, from Friday. Uh, before then, there will be a mainly dry evening with any lingering rain over the Midlands and East Anglia soon dying out. Most places staying dry overnight, with low cloud, mist and fog developing in the south, but the northwest will turn wet and windy later. You can expect some gales on northwestern coasts. It's going to be quite mild. Southern Britain will be dry with sunny spells tomorrow. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, well, that's all from the UK tonight. You can catch up on all the highlights on our webpage, head to skynews.com, or you can scan the QR code on your screen. You can share your thoughts with us there as well. Coming up next on The World, uh, Yalda Hakim will have the latest on the humanitarian crisis in Gaza with the former Foreign Secretary, David Miliband.